Greetings. Vijnana Bhairava Tantra, verse 80. So this is cause for celebration because we have reached the halfway point in the text, both in terms of the total number of verses and in terms of the total number of techniques taught in the text. We are halfway through and it's been over a year, I think 14 months, that I've been making these videos, exploring this scripture with you. Uh, none of it would have been possible without the generous support of the patrons on Patreon, 193 of them currently. So thank you from the bottom of my heart, patrons. And any of you who feel so inclined to join them can get even more uh, juicy content there. So now we're in the middle of this section or, or, or module of the text on daily life practices. It's not 100% that because we've seen some esoteric mudras pop up. <laughs> And, uh, but most of the, the practices in this section of the text are indeed daily life practices that you can do anywhere, anytime. Many of them are what I call micro meditations or are intended in that way. And uh, we'll continue, we'll continue for um, hopefully until we <laughs> reach the end of this, of this uh, text certainly we'll finish out um, all the yuktis. And one thing I, I wanna mention before I forget is that uh, we're now planning and hope to make a really beautiful, streamlined, simple, but powerful meditation app, which will present simplified versions in audio only, not video, simplified versions of all the VBT meditations. Simplified uh, meaning practicable by people who don't yet have much experience with tantric meditation. Um, and, you know, <laughs> there'll always be a place for the more kind of advanced uh, or detailed versions of these practices, which um, I, some of them I offer on retreat and there's other folks out there teaching from this text as well, like Paul Muller and Sally Kempton and others. But I think it would be great for the world of, of well, meditators, <laughs> because all the meditation apps out there now are sort of Vipassana based. Um, you know, there's no tantric meditation app. So simplified versions of all the VBT Yuktis, maybe not all, most of them. Um, in audio in a, in a beautiful app. That's a new goal. So uh, that's exciting to contemplate. Okay, so I just mentioned that because again, we're at this halfway point, we're halfway through the text. <laughs> it's quite exciting. Uh, and what's amazing is it actually gets deeper. There's some extremely powerful contemplations coming up in the text and even insights into the nature of reality that, that seem utterly cutting edge even in 2019. So those are very interesting to explore. But first we get some more daily life practices and some of these are quite profound as well, including uh, today's practice or the practice in this video. So let's, let's encounter the practice now. Stula rupasya bhavasya stabdham drishtim nipatya cha achirena niradharam mana kritva shivam vrajet. Casting an unmoving gaze upon a being with physical form and making the mind Niradhara, free of thoughts and projections, free of the support of mental constructs, the apparent support, 
about whatever you're gazing at. Then in very little time, you will attain the Shiva state. So such an interesting verse. Now, let's just look at the components of this practice. First, it's obviously an open-eyed meditation. And what are you gazing at? Well, any bhava, any existent thing which has a physical form, stula rupa. Now, the interesting thing about the word bhava is it has, it has many meanings actually, but it, it often means existent thing or being. So it can be used for inanimate and animate things. So here we, we have the phrase stula rupa, something with a physical form, right? Now, I think the default object of open-eyed meditation that the author has in mind is indeed um, a statue or a carving or a sculpture of a deity, right? Such as you see, oops, <laughs> I'm back to front. Such as you see behind me here, that's um, Dakshinamurti Shiva, right? Why do I say this? Because Stula Rupa is a term often used to mean the anthropomorphic form of a deity, especially a statue or so-called idol, as opposed to the Sukshma Rupa of the deity, which is their Yantra or Mandala or Mantra. Sometimes the Mantra is called the Ati Sukshma Rupa, the, the very subtle form. So I'm not, I'm not saying the object of meditation here should be a statue of a deity. In fact, if you don't have um, a relationship with one or more of these divine archetypes, then I don't recommend that that's the object of your meditation. It could be anything. The verse literally says it could be anything, anything with a physical form, okay? Um, but it, it, it shouldn't be something that's sort of moving about. <laughs> you know, it shouldn't be your cat, unless your cat is going to stay put for the duration of the practice. Uh, and cats are sort of notorious for not doing that, right? They'll stay put except when you want them to. So anything that's gonna stay put though, you know, if maybe for cats asleep, that's fine. Um, now, what are the elements of the practice? You cast an unmoving gaze, a stabda dershti, an unmoving gaze, right? So you need to be quite still and the eyes are, are still. So you need to make the eyes soft, the eyelids soft, so you're not tempted to sort of look around. Now, the key to the practice though, is that you make the mind niradhara. So I translated free of thoughts and projections, okay? Now this, you know, maybe sounds like a, quite a modern translation, but also Jaydev Singh has make the mind free of all prop of thought constructs, right? The, the mind tends to try to prop itself up with its uh, stories about things, right? The limited mind, the conditioned mind, whatever you want to call that. Um, One could say, make the mind supportless, niradhara, supportless. But what does that actually mean? Um, here I agree with, with Jaydev Singh, eh, who's saying, so free of the apparent support of your stories about or thought constructs about whatever you're gazing at, okay? So whether, whether it's an image of a deity, whether it's your cat, whatever it is, you're going to try to temporarily suspend your, your, the mental frame you have about that object or what it represents to you or what sort of thing or being it is, meaning to say, you're going to try to see without your story about that object or, per, or well, person. Could be a person, actually, if you're both doing the meditation, right? Because they need to also stay put for the, for the practice, right? You could, you could do the meditation on each other. Wonderful challenge, actually. Uh, if this is someone you're close to, no matter how much you love them, you have a lot of stories about them. 
And it's, it's very easy to be relating to your mental image of the person more than the person themselves as they are in this moment, which is always at least ever so slightly different from how they've been in any other moment, right? Because we are um, beings that whether you realize it or not are constantly reinventing ourselves and each experience makes us a different sort of person even if it's subtle so you, you the practices to see past your stories about about the person right and th i've done this this can be very powerful uh, especially with a loved one you know to see them anew afresh as something other than your stories about them right so literally it can be any sort of object whatsoever um, or, or living or, or inanimate. But that's the key, you know, and it's not, it's, it's easier than you might think, right? The verse says in very little time, a chirena, you can attain the Shiva state. The Shiva state it, it, here is simply being with what is sort of prior to or aside from your story about it. And I think this word niradhara is very important because it, 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 it refers to the fact that normally the mind, the egoic mind, you might say, tries to prop itself up with its own stories it, because one feels secure, more sort of secure or comfortable when you think you know what's going on <laughs> or you think you know someone, right? And do you notice, like, for example, especially with uh, family members or perhaps long-term friends, when you begin undergoing changes on, on the spiritual path or due to your practice of yoga, do you notice that there's people in your life that resist that, that are uncomfortable with that, right? And this is, this is not because they don't want you to grow. This is because most humans stay comfortable and in an illusion of security by believing they know. They know roughly what life is all about or the way humans are or the way you are or the way again even their pet is right there's this comfort for most people in living in um a mind world it's actually that they're they're not living in reality directly they're living in their their stories about reality and it's comfortable but also what's key on the spiritual path is that it um gives rise you know, often very slowly to this kind of stagnation. And stagnation is this corrosive but subtle kind of suffering. Well, it's subtle until it's not, until it gets <laughs> unbearable, um, which it, it, it does for anyone on the spiritual path, but not for everyone. So this, the, there's a kind of um, unaliveness in believing your stories about reality. As one of my teachers says, to know that you don't know is to feel very alive. To know that you don't know is itself automatically to, to feel very alive. You are in touch with your aliveness when you're in touch with don't know mind. Don't know mind doesn't mean that you don't have valid insights or intuitions. It's, it's about knowing that your conceptual understanding of anything is not that thing, is not that, that nothing is your story about it. Literally nothing in the world is your story about it. So this is a profound contemplation. And I, I invite you to contemplate. There's a big difference between knowing stuff about stuff and knowing what it is. So you know lots of th things about things, <laughs> but the isness, the suchness, is actually impenetrable to the conceptual mind. The suchness that, uh, of reality is impenetrable to the conceptual mind. It's un incomprehensible. Okay. So you simply, um, gaze at any object, being, thing, or person, laying aside your stories about them and see what happens. 
ओम